Hello, my name is Lindsay Romick Rosendale, and I am the director of the NMR based metabonomics facility at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, and also an assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of nutrition and metabolism um, in the general population, and then talk briefly about um, how we're implementing a clinical research study to really understand how nutrition and metabolism is functioning in the FA population. Now, our bodies are constantly reinventing themselves in this perpetual state of loss, but also always rebuilding. And even though all of this is happening at the cellular level, the consequences of these things happening couldn't be bigger. Now, these two sets of reactions, both catabolic and anabolic, together make up your metabolism. So really, what is metabolism? Well, people talk about metabolism in terms of how fast your body burns the fuel in your food or how high your personal energy level is. And that's fine for an article, say, in a personal fitness magazine. But physiologically, metabolism really describes every single biochemical reaction that's going on in your body. Now, these molecules that your body is constantly breaking up and then are rebuilding only to have them break apart again are what we know as nutrients. And these nutrients are the materials the body needs to build, maintain, and repair itself. Now there's six major groups, and while all of them are important, there are three that everyone always seems to talk about and that we see on our food labels. And that's carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Now, rather than go into excruciating detail and list every compound represented within these groups, we will focus on the important stuff. The main thing that you need to know is that the monosaccharide glucose is the be all end all molecular fuel that your cells need to make ATP. Now, ATP being the molecule that your cells use to drive those anabolic reactions we talked about, like when they need to make new polymers or get basically anything else done, whether it's operating a sodium potassium pump or detaching the head of a myosin filament to contract a muscle. But ATP is too unstable to store. So cells often store energy in the form of glucose, which they can then catabolize or break down and convert to ATP when they need to. Now, we're talking about the cells of a typical individual with no underlying metabolic dysfunction in this case. And in addition to getting energy from ATP, some of your cells can also get energy from fats, but many of the most important ones feed exclusively on glucose. Now, let's take your brain, for instance. Your, your brain is much like a car. A car needs gas, oil, brakes, brake fluid, and other materials to run properly. Your brain also needs special materials to run properly. Vitamins, minerals, other essential chemicals, and glucose. Now, the fuel or energy for your brain is glucose. You can get glucose by eating carbohydrates or other foods that can be converted to glucose, but if it's not needed right away, that energy can also get stored as glycogen in your liver and muscles. So again, your body is always working to ensure that you have the nutrients needed to make things like ATP for energy. If your body doesn't believe that it already has what it needs, it will resort to catabolizing or breaking down sometimes important molecules to then later use the breakdown products to rebuild what it thinks is missing. So there's just a whole lot going on within our bodies constantly that we're really unaware of. Now, our bodies don't handle every food or nutrient that enters, enters it into the same way. After you're done digesting, some nutrients will go straight to your body's pile of sort of stuff that burn right away, but others are going to be converted into something else. For example, the carbs and fats in your buttered toast can be directly oxidized into usable energy, but the amino acids and the bacon have to be converted into molecules that get broken down, like carbs, and if you want to get energy out of those. 
So as I mentioned before, the molecules in your body are constantly changing shape and renewing and rearranging themselves to either build things or to use energy, and eating food replenishes these nutrients, especially glucose. Then depending on what your body needs and when you last ate, certain hormones like insulin will help decide what to burn and what to store later. Now, this, of course, is an important function of hormones, which is why things can go badly if this process doesn't work properly because of an underlying metabolic disorder. Exactly how glucose levels can spike or plummet, how we convert nutrients into energy, and how all of that relates to eating and hunger and weight, metabolism, and your health in general is obviously complicated. But because we're all living things that have to eat in order to stay alive, we think that this is an area we're studying and we're trying to better understand how this works in the context of Fanconi anemia. If we're talking about a typical individual, when it comes to how this energy that we're going to talk about is converted and where, that depends largely on when that person ate their last meal. So we all switch back and forth between two nutritional states, the absorptive or fed state, which is during or after eating, and the post-absorptive or fasting state when the GI tract is empty and the body is running off those stored supplies. So let's say that you've just finished dinner and you're still in the absorptive stage and your digestive system breaks up the food into a bunch of mostly glucose molecules that pass into your bloodstream. Now, the first bit of glucose gets delivered throughout the body and is tapped to generate ATP or energy on the spot through cellular respiration. But that's not what happens to all of it. And you've got a lot of extra glucose sort of floating around in there that your cells don't need at that moment. Now, energy in the form of ATP is too unstable to be used for storage, which means that all that extra glucose has got to be stored as fat or glycogen. And that storage is part of how you can end up gaining weight because how much energy gets stored depends partly on your basal metabolic rate. Now, normally, if your body senses that glucose levels are too high, a series of events will trigger that take them back down. At this point, there's a shift from catabolic reactions to anabolic reactions. For example, it puts a stop to breaking down glycogen in your liver and muscles to release glucose for energy and instead ramps up the process of glycogenesis where extra glucose is linked together to form glycogen. It also activates lipogenesis where the liver converts glucose to triglycerides and then ships them off to our adipose tissue for storage. So let's say that your body has put all the glucose, lipids, and proteins where they need to go, and you can just coast into that post-absorptive or fasting state. Several hours later, even though your small intestine is still hard at work, your cells have been helping themselves to that remaining glucose in the blood, and eventually your blood sugar levels will start to drop. And this will essentially trigger the opposite process to happen, resulting in the release of glucose, fatty acids, and glycerol back into the bloodstream. Now, if it's been a few days since you've eaten for some reason, and you've used your blood glucose and your glycogen stores, and you don't have any sugars left to feed things like your brain, your body will launch into what's called gluconeogenesis and start converting fats and amino acids into glucose so that you can get that energy your brain, for your brain cells. But is this the norm? What if something has gone awry and our bodies either prefer or are forced into functioning as though it's in a state of prolonged fasting, even when it isn't? What if our bodies simply continue to store glucose and break down fats, proteins, and amino acids for energy? Does my body and the body of a person with Fanconi anemia process nutrients in the same manner? Are the same metabolic processes turned on and off for both myself and a person with FA? These are the questions that we're working to answer with our research study.
Now, before we dive into the study itself, I'd like to give a really brief introduction into the scientific technique that will largely be utilized for the study. So my area of research is called metabolomics. And while the, world the word was made up in the late 90s and isn't the easiest to pronounce, it essentially means that I study all of those small molecules that we talked about in the first few slides, like glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, ATP, et cetera. The great thing is that so much is actually known about metabolism and all these complex pathways that are constantly at work in our bodies. And so this allows us to create metabolic maps as shown here, when persons with a metabolic disorder or dysfunction are discovered. So we essentially know how the body's metabolism should work to function optimally. So we can start to tweeze apart what's gone wrong and hopefully work to fix it. We can uh, try to really understand the metabolism of different organisms, organisms by analyzing what's inside any number of biological fluids or tissues. We simply process a sample, put it inside of our nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectrometer, and as that's what Jack is standing by here, obtain a metabolic profile of that sample. We can then go on to get quantities of those compounds like glucose and lactate in a given urine, blood, tissue sample, and then we compare those amounts across hundreds of patients and between individuals within healthy and disease populations. And if you come to visit us, I may just end up putting you to work like I did my good friend Jack, um, whom some of you may know. We'll be using a technique known as stable isotope resolved metabolomics for our study. Now, this is sometimes also referred to as isotope tracing or metabolic flux analysis, but the idea is the same in that we have the ability to trace individual atoms of carbon that make up the glucose molecule. So we can trace the label glucose that you ingest orally from glycolysis and the cytoplasm to the Krebs cycle and the mitochondria, and then to lipid biosynthesis in the cytoplasm. All of these important molecules that play a role in cellular respiration and allow for our bodies to function optimally are traceable to determine their fates. We can trace these molecules through the process of cellular respiration in persons with FA and without and work to understand what's different and how we can go about fixing it, so to speak. The study design is, is really pretty straightforward. You'll come in for the first, uh, the first thing in the morning so that you're in a fasted state. We will collect baseline urine and blood samples and perform a few standard body composition assessments like checking your grip strength with what's called a dynamometer, measuring skin folds with, cal with calipers, and then have you just do this simple uh, breathing exercise under a tent uh, that's hooked up to really a cool machine that basically monitors your oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. And that machine is called indirect calorimetry. And this gives us a really very clear and precise measurement of what your specific basal metabolic rate is. It also helps us to know what your body prefers to burn as an energy source, carbs, fats, proteins, etc. So the study participant will then drink a concentrated sugar water drink, where instead of that standard glucose, we've actually labeled all of those carbon atoms of the glucose to allow us to trace it as it is taken up and used throughout the body. We then will get also a midpoint and endpoint readings of urine and blood. And we're also going to go ahead and repeat that uh, body composition analysis in terms of the tented breathing again, at one point during the study, just to see what happens after you drink that glucose while in a fasted state. We should see a stiff, uh, a, a short and, but strong shift in your metabolic rate. The entire study as a whole uh, will begin around 7 a.m. and it would end at about noon or 12.30, so right in time for lunchtime. So I just wanted to show a little bit of preliminary data as we have been enrolling and um, 
performing study visits for our healthy volunteer population. So here you see three healthy volunteers. And what I'm showing here is that we do successfully get incorporation of that labeled of those labeled carbons um, into the system. So these individuals are simply drinking um, the glucose as opposed to being injected or anything like that. And the next thing that we look at is lactate because ultimately a large amount of that glucose will be converted to lactate. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this lower right quadrant is that's lactate and it is labeled with, we can tell the difference whether it is or isn't labeled with um, the carbon atoms that we have labeled our glucose with. And you can see spikes and shifts in all three of our participants. And obviously these participants are of various age, gender, um, and also of varying um, body compositions to begin with. And so um, they are going to be slight, but you can see a um, peak and a downward movement of the levels of lactate in the plasma for each of these individuals, well, indicating that we are seeing uptake and utilization of this glucose that they're drinking, which is a great sign. Now, something else that we look at are not only in terms of glucose, which you're seeing on the top, which again, we very clearly see increased levels, which we should, of that labeled glucose and what we call enrichment in the, this is again in the plasma of, of our healthy volunteers. We also, again, see an increase in the labeling of the lactate. And then we also, I've just chosen um, one uh, small metabolite. We see numerous um, label that are neighbor labeled, but then you can also see that alanine is also um, incorporating these labeled carbon atoms. And we can see an increase um, in the level of alanine over time as well. Again, this is from, from baseline all the way up to three to four hours of post um, consumption of the labeled glucose. Now, we believe that um, elucidating for the first time the molecular, molecular mechanisms and metabolic pathways that are impacting the nutritional status of persons with FA will assist in the development of novel therapies and nutritional approaches that will improve the overall physical and emotional health, as well as the body images of individuals with FA. And in the future, we can continue to use NMR spectroscopy to monitor the response to novel treatments and to better understand newly identified metabolic abnormalities. This is again just um, an overview of our study. Uh, if you have any questions or you would like to consider um, enrolling and participating in the study, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my email address and my work and cell phone are also listed here, and I would be happy to discuss the study details um, with anyone who is interested a bit more. Thank you for your time.